Praise God. Well, if all of you have your notes, we've been preaching authority. This is authority through the cross number three. And the subtitle of this is The Path, The Authority of the Cross, number three, and The Path. And what it occurred to me is it, one of the prophetic generals, uh, you know, which we won't go into all that at the moment, but one of the prophetic generals it's with national prominence made a comment in one of his programs the other day that I was listening to. And the comment was, is that he feels like that the Holy Spirit told him that the word of faith or the this subject that we're covering, generally speaking, an aspect of the word of faith is one of the key things you need to have in your life to get through these attacks that are going on in our country. Now, some people may rejoice in that and some people may go, oh, me. But my response to all of that is I've always felt that this particular understanding was critical to our success in life as believers. But also, given the fact that some of these guys, especially this general, is talking about the importance of this and mastering this to deal with the attacks and the, the severe things that are going on in our country, I, thought, I felt it especially stirred to want to just add some things to us about this subject of authority and how to use authority. Amen? Amen. So it's very, very important. Let's start out in Luke 10. And what I thought I would do is, uh, what I thought I would, I can't tell you the number of people over the years that seem to struggle with this concept of exercising authority, making command decrees. Some people are very comfortable with it. Some people, you know, don't, they struggle with it. You say, how do you know that? Because you teach on this stuff over and over, and then you go say, now let's pray. And the people, a huge portion of the people you pray with when you say, let's make some command decrees, begin to, when they say, now you pray. And they go, Father, thank you that you've given. They don't make any decrees. They start praying back to God. And that, you know, that, that's a good thing, but that's not what we're talking about here. Praying to God is a great thing, but that's not what we're talking about. Authority requires that you step into a place of making command decrees against something or to something. Amen. So what I thought I would do is, let's just talk about the steps that you can walk through to get to a place where you're ready to exercise authority. Let's assume, since this is on um, YouTube, let's assume that this is for more than us, okay? More than just us who are sitting here. Let's assume that we're talking to the body of Christ, and let's also assume that uh, we've got some people sitting out there. It says, I've heard about all this authority all my life, but I don't know if I'm really comfortable in how to use this, okay? And we're talking to those people as well as to ourselves. Amen. So Luke 10, 19 in the ESV. So that's what I want to do in the next several messages. I don't know how long this will go on, but I want to talk about some of the steps that you need to go through to get you to a place where you're comfortable to exercise authority and to use command decrees, both in your life and over the things that are opposing you. Luke 10, 19 in the ESV. It starts out with, I beheld Satan like lightning fall from heaven. But in the ESV, it says, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. The reason I'm bringing this out is I, I noticed this the other day for the first time, actually, uh, because in the King James Version, the King James Version says, Behold, I give you authority in the present tense, Okay. But the ESV says, behold, I have given you authority. Talking about it in the past tense. Well, the Greek grammar is in the perfect. And I thought to myself when I read this, that gives you a whole different thing because it looks like in the King James that he's saying, I'm giving it to you now. But in the, in the NA27 text in the ESV, Jesus was saying, now they were coming back from having used this, okay? And he said, I have given you authority over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And the reason I wanted to point that out is I thought to myself when I read that, well, if I have given you authority, and it's not I am giving you, not that one's right and one's wrong, but just the one text talks about it has already been given to you. I thought to myself, where did Jesus give them authority? Because they're returning from having used this and seeing demons cast out and using authority. So where was this statement fulfilled? Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. Now this is Luke chapter 10. 
and, that, and that's in the ESV. So let's go back to Luke 10.1 and look at the verse and kind of draw some conclusions about how this works, okay? Luke, uh, okay. Okay. Folks, the conclusion to this is always bring your paper Bible. Amen. Luke 10, 1. It says this, And after these things the Lord appointed other seventy also, and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself would go. Therefore he said unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Folks, now here's the thing is notice in 10.1, it says the Lord appointed 70 others also. This whole concept of authority comes off of a very, very simple thing. And that is Jesus took them aside, took the boys in a group, took them in a group, just like I would go over to Danny and say, Danny, I'm going to send you out into the harvest field. Oh, sorry, I'm stepping out of the camera here. Danny, I'm going to send you into the harvest field. And as you go, I'm giving you supernatural things to do out there and make sure that you give away healing as you go. Make sure that you distribute my peace as you go. And that's what Jesus did to the 70. He said, go in, into all the places where I'm going to go. Amen. Now, folks, that's where this thing of authority starts. Authority is imparted by the Holy Spirit just taking you aside and either a scripture is lit up or in this case, as it was with the disciples saying, here's the deal, go into the harvest field. Here's the supernatural you're going to use, heal the sick, give away my peace and do this for me and bring in a harvest of souls. Amen. That's where authority comes from. From the moment Jesus took them aside and said, this is what I want you to do. From the moment he did that, that was when he said, behold, I have given you authority. You know why? Because when Jesus rose from the dead in Matthew 28, it says, all authority in heaven and in earth is given unto me, Jesus said. So Jesus is the possessor of all authority. The authority that we use down here on the earth is simply authority that Jesus, it's his authority given to us to use to bring the kingdom of God here on the earth just as it is in heaven. And that's how, that's the starting place of it. If you're trying to use authority from your mind and you've never had the Holy Spirit put his arm around you and take you off to the side and say, here, this is what I want you to do. That's, you're missing a vital step in trying to apply this because that's how it's imparted. Jesus beat the devil. He got all of it. He wants to give it to you. Okay. He wants you to have it. It's his. You don't have to be confused about thinking you're doing some super spiritual thing. It's his authority given to you to use to bring the kingdom of God from heaven here to the earth. And it ain't going to happen any other way. Okay. Because when he sent them out to preach the kingdom in the Bible, that's what he did. He took, he took them off to the side and says, go into the harvest field and here's the supernatural that I'm going to give you to go out there and bring laborers in. Amen. Now, if you want to see this pattern repeated, let's go to Luke chapter 9 and verse 1. And he called his 12 disciples, good, and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now, the reason I brought this up, because Jesus used the same pattern when he commissioned the 12 as he used when he gave authority to the 70. Are you following this? He drew the 12 aside this time, and, he, and, he, and, he, and it specifically says he gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases, and then he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He used the exact same pattern with the 12 that he used with the 70. He drew them aside to himself and said, guys, go out into the harvest field, and as you go, here's the supernatural that I give you to go into the harvest field. 
I want you to heal the sick. I want you to bring the kingdom to this earth. I want you to cure diseases and then give you power and authority over all devils. Some devils? Come on, all devils, all right? You will be supernaturally opposed by the demonic realm at some point in this process. And you've got to reckon in your heart, Jesus gave you the authority, not over some devils, not over the devils that are hassling you, but over the de all demons were given in this authority for you to have both power and authority over. And trust me, as you use this stuff, you're going to need that at some point in your life, maybe more often than you wish. But do you see the point? The simplicity is Jesus, by the Spirit, draws you off to yourself. And when you're in the Spirit and studying the Word or listening to the preached Word and something quickens to your heart, you should pay close attention to that because God is actually imparting authority over the thing that he just quickened you to. Amen. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Um, Derek Prince, I, you know, example that happened to me years ago to show you the simplicity of this is I was in a Derek Prince meeting. This was a long, long time ago. And I had never seen a miracle and he was ministering on the gifts of the Spirit and God used him in this way. They, you don't see this as much as you did back then, but he would pray for people's legs and they would either get back adjustments or their legs would actually be lengthened. And I saw a lady walk up on the platform that had platform shoes that must have been three or four inches high and she walked off the platform and she couldn't walk in those platform shoes. There was no way you could fake that. There was no way you could do that. And I was deeply touched. And as I was sitting there trying to f lean over everybody I could to see these miracles, because I'd never seen a miracle, the Holy Spirit spoke to me inside, but it was so loud inside, I thought somebody was speaking behind me. And he just said in a very straightforward way, he said, you can do that. And I turned around and I looked and said, I can? Who, who said that? I looked behind me. It was so clear. I looked behind me and said, I thought somebody behind me was speaking in the back of my ear. Now, what I'm saying to you is I took that to heart. I believed it. Okay, number one, I believed it. And then I started looking for places to apply it. And sure enough, I started finding people that needed that. And I started doing that and God started working miracles. That was the beginning of my walk in the supernatural. Folks, it's that simple. It's that simple. Trying to use all this stuff without that personal interaction of the Holy Spirit, it just is making something that was supposed to be easy, it's making it very, very hard. Well, I know more verses than you. Well, hot diggity dog. Okay? That doesn't make any difference how many verses. The question is, is how, which of those verses has the Holy Spirit drawn you aside and said, this promise is for you? This promise, you're into the harvest, you're a laborer, you have authority and power over all devils and to heal the sick. And, you know, can it actually be that simple, Henry? Yes, it's that simple. Just Jesus pulling you aside by the Spirit and saying, you, have, you can do this, whether it's concerning the promises of God or whether it's concerning becoming a laborer and the things that you can do as a laborer. What, it doesn't matter what it is, any of the promises of God, the beginnings of authority is when Jesus pulls you aside and just says, here, this is yours, or, in, or quickens you to the fact that you can do this. And it really is that simple. You say, well, I haven't had very much of that. Well, you know, we'll pray for you to have more because that's how simple this is. And I don't find very many places in the New Covenant where people did things and believed things without this kind of interaction. It's yours. Jesus died for this. It is this simple. My whole life of the, the supernatural was brought forth in my life by just watching somebody minister in the supernatural and then the Holy Spirit making me aware that I could do the same thing. And, I, and to be quite honest, when he spoke that to me all those years ago, I said, me? I can? That, that was my response. You say, not much of a response of faith. God knew that I wanted to, right? He knew that I wanted to. He just simply needed, it was just like, I can do that too? 
How many of you have ever had a promise of God that the Holy Spirit's quickened to your heart and your gut honest reaction is, boy, I'd really like that, Lord, but I just don't know about that. Come on. That's just a common response in, in, among Christian people. So this is like the first step in releasing authority in your life is when you, you say to the Lord, draw me aside, Lord, and start talking to me about the things that you want me to do. Amen. That's why I'm so excited about this meeting that's coming up is I feel like a lot of that is capable of going on. Amen. Does that make sense to you? That's how simple it is to get authority started. And now there's a lot of working parts, and that's kind of what I want to talk to us about as we go forward is some of the parts that need to be in place for you to move in this. But the start is that simple. God, draw me aside and just show me what you want me to do. Amen. There's some other parts, and we'll talk about that. What do you think about that? Doesn't that simplify this whole thing down to just, oh, well, well, if that's all that's involved, I can do that. That's the right conclusion, okay? That's the right conclusion. Spend some time with God and see what he's saying to you. Now, Matthew 8, 5 through 13, this is that famous story of the centurion. And let's read it again to refresh our memory. When Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant lies at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said, I will come and heal him. And the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers unto me. And I say to this man, go, and he goes to another come and he comes into my servant do this and he doeth it and Jesus heard it and he marveled and said to them that followed verily I say unto you I have not found so great faith no not in Israel now this particular verse has been a year this is one of those verses that I have studied I don't know if this has just been obvious to most people but as I read this verse For years, I asked myself and the Lord the question, Lord, why is it that the centurion gave you a lecture on how authority works and the only thing you were commented on was his faith? Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about that or not, but it's just like the centurion wasn't talking about faith, folks. The whole concept of the centurion was Jesus, you don't have to physically come and heal my servant because I am a man in the Roman army under authority and I know how authority works. In the Roman army, in my position, if I say to this man, go, he goes, to this man, come, he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. I get how authority works and I know who you are and the authority that you have. And he said, and if, believe me, in my, in my world, if I tell my servant to come and he doesn't serve, Rome is behind me and will make him come. His entire discourse to Jesus was about authority. Jesus didn't comment one word about the centurion's understanding of authority. Come on, folks, you got to think this through. Why would Jesus do that? Why would Jesus listen to a discourse on authority? And then his comment was, I haven't found faith like this in all of Israel. And then he lamented and said, many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom are going to miss out and there'll be an outer darkness with with weeping and gnashing of teeth. Praise the Lord. Have you ever wondered that? Well, if you haven't, let me raise the question for you. Because Jesus here was making an inseparable relationship between authority and faith. There's something about the relationship between authority and faith. The two are so directly tied together that the centurion could speak for two minutes on how authority worked. And all that Jesus heard was, man, I haven't found faith like yours in the entire nation of Israel. And he had no covenant, folks. He was a Roman. If that doesn't stir you up, it should. It's like if if somebody without a covenant could get this kind of commendation from the Lord Jesus Christ, then maybe I need to understand authority and look for the same kind of commendation from Jesus that he gave the centurion. Does that make sense to you? 
Praise the Lord. So Jesus raised this up. Now, what I want to suggest to you is a very, very simple thing. But this is something I believe the Holy Spirit showed me about why Jesus spoke like this. And here it is. When the Holy Spirit quickens you and when you perceive faith arising in your heart, okay, over a promise or over something that God tells you he wants you to do, when you feel that going on, when faith arises in your heart, activates inside of you by the Spirit concerning the promises of God, any one of them, or concerning something he wants you to do by a direct rhema word. When that faith is activated in your heart, faith brings with it the authority to do what you're quickened to do. Now let's stop for a minute and make sure you got that. When you feel faith arise in your heart by the Spirit of God and by your choice to believe that something is true in the word that God has shown you, when that faith arises in your heart, with the faith of God comes the authority of Jesus to make that thing that you now have faith for to make that thing come to pass. Now, if you can hear that, that'll start a revolution in your life. The, I want to suggest to you, at least in part, that Jesus made this inseparable relationship between authority and faith. He was, he, they were so directly tied in his thinking that someone who really understood authority was in fact manifesting great faith. Are you all following this? And so the inseparable relationship that Jesus, I believe, was talking about is when faith arises in your heart for something, authority is communicated by that faith to your life and you will need the authority to bring to pass the very thing that you're believing for. Amen. I don't know how many more different ways you could say that, but that's a revelation, okay? Because most of this stuff is preached on separately, isn't it? Faith is preached on this week and next week we preach on authority as if they're two di distinctly different things and they are different things. But Jesus tied them together and most people, the way you, you can tell they don't realize this, they can, because they receive a revelation on something and you don't hear them, you don't hear the changes in their speech, you don't see the changes in their action. When that happens, you don't understand this, okay? Because what you should be doing is when you get a revelation on a promise, you should be saying to yourself, Man, I have the authority to bring this to pass as well as the belief that it's true. Praise God. I wish I could put a little can opener around your brain and open it up and just dump this in, but I can't. The Holy Spirit does all that. Amen. Does that make any sense to you? If it makes sense to you, then authority, that would be a point that would help you come to the place where you realize authority is not mysterious. If you have faith for something, and I know you have the faith of God in, a, in, in a, you know, the measure of faith, but I'm talking about something specifically quickened to you, and that you realize you, when you have faith for something, you have authority for the thing that you have faith for, and you're, you're capable of exercising it. So stop trying to believe and then someday I'll get authority and when I get authority, I'll access, you know. It doesn't work that way. When, you, when faith arises, faith carries with it the authority. That's from Jesus, okay? Jesus made that crossover association. If you have a great authority, what was Jesus' comment? Then that, that you have great faith. So I think, that that's, I think that's a safe assumption. I give that to you. That's a little, there may be more to that verse understanding than God has shown me. But that was one thing that finally explained to me why all this stuff is. When you start, folks, I'll tell you something. When you start seeing these overlaps, I call them, where one truth in the Bible relates to another truth and they work together to bring about a result, that's when you see this stuff start to work. Because when you understand how they work together, you stop segmenting it in your mind and you start using them as a whole. Amen. So that I thought I'd give you that. Um, that's the relationship between faith and authority. Now, one of the things, like, for example, let's just take some examples of this. Let's take a healing example. Let's suppose you're attacked with some sort of a sickness, and you begin to pray about it, 
And as you begin to pray about the sickness that you're attacked with, you begin to see yourself through the cross and certain verses become alive to you, okay? And let's suppose, for example, the verse that became alive to you is Matthew 8, 17. He took our infirmities and removed our sicknesses. And you start thinking about that, you know, you're being attacked with a sickness and you're meditating on that verse. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit whispers into your heart, this isn't yours. This isn't your sickness. And you think, well, wait a minute. Now, remember, authority was over what? All devils, right? and sickness and disease and everything else. And so all of a sudden you think, you think to yourself, what am, I, what am I doing putting up with this? You know, this is, a, this is truly a revelation. And all of a sudden as that dawns on you, you think, well, wait a minute, this is not mine. So I come against this sickness in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I command this sickness out of my body in Jesus' name. Go and go now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's an example of, of, of a different way to treat this thing of, Lord, please heal me. Now, it's not, there's nothing wrong with petition, okay? We're going to talk about that in a minute. There's nothing wrong with petition. But at some point in petition, you're going to have to stop asking and start believing that you've got it and start using authority to bring to pass what is already given to you. Because here's the deal. I think it's the amplified version in Hebrews 11, one says, faith is the title deed. What we've got to get comfortable with is the ownership of the promises are transferred to you in the unseen realm, regardless of circumstances. Well, I don't like that. I'll believe that I receive it when I see God do it. Well, good luck with that because that's not the way the system was set up by God. Faith is, I think it's the Amplified says, faith is the title deed of what we hope for, the evidence of what we do not see. Faith is given to you as evidence, as proof that in the unseen realm, God has given the answer to your prayer to you. And it's yours, and it's yours before you see it. It's yours before you feel it. It's yours before you experience it. That's the way God does business. He does business in the unseen realm. Well, I don't like that. Well, I'm sorry. And that's how it works. You know, you get comfortable with something. My job isn't to tell you what you'd like to believe. My job is to tell you what the word says so you can change and adopt what you need to that. Does that make any sense to you? You don't need, I don't like that. I want to feel it. I want to touch it. Everybody wants to feel it and touch it. Everybody gets to feel it and touch it. But the title deed is transferred in the unseen realm. And so the authority, as faith arises in your heart, the authority to bring to pass the promise was given to you in the unseen realm. Praise the Lord. And you just simply need to get comfortable with that. Now, will you ever see it, feel it, and touch it? Yes, you get to see it, feel it, and touch it. But the title deed isn't transferred by seeing, feeling, and touching. The title deed is transferred by believing in the unseen realm that something is given to you. You believe that it's yours before you see it, before you touch it, and before you feel it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, let's look at Mark eleven twenty four. 24. We were, t we were sitting around, and maybe have a few more examples if the Lord will grace us with those. We were sitting around the other night around, you know, uh, we were sitting with Danny and Gina and myself in Texas. We were at a restaurant having dinner. Anyway, long story short, we were talking and I was saying, you know, one of the mysteries, we were just having fellowship. And I said, you know, one of the mysteries that always has, that I've always wondered about, and I'm not sure I really know the answer to this, but one of the things I've always wondered about is, why do you teach this stuff and explain it to people and, and then ask them to pray? And after you tell them, now take authority over this, and you ask them to pray, and some of them go, Lord, would you heal me from this in Jesus' name? They dropped back to bed. I said, why, is, why does that happen more times than I can count? I wonder what's really behind that. And honestly, that is one of the questions that I have asked the Lord for years, is why is this for some people so difficult to find this flow and to use this? Now, for other people, they just pop right in it, okay? 
but in my experience has been there's more people that 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 don't pop right in it than there are that pop right in it okay but that's neither here nor there my experience is just that it's my experience so anyway we were sitting around the table and I said, I wonder why people default to the petition mode when you're encouraging them to take authority and, take, and make a command over something. Why does that happen so much? And Gina just popped out, you know, and she said, you know, it's probably because they don't believe they really have it. And I thought to myself, and the Holy Spirit took that statement and quickened it to my heart. And I thought, that may not be the only reason why people do that. But one of the real re that makes sense to me, because if I'm telling you to take authority and telling you to command something and you don't believe it's yours, you don't believe that God has given it to you, well, then why would you command something? The only, reason, the only reason a sergeant in the army says, private, go over and disassemble that rifle. The only reason he makes that command is because he knows he has the right to make that private go disassemble that rifle if necessary, y'all following this? And I thought if people don't, if people are still uncomfortable with the unseen realm and don't realize that the ownership transfers in the unseen realm when you can't see it, feel it, or touch it, and you're supposed to reach out and receive it as yours in that realm, if you're not comfortable with that and you don't believe it's yours, then if I tell you, take authority over that cold and command it to leave your body, well, I can understand completely what you're doing. You're defaulting to petition because in your heart, you don't believe it's yours. You don't believe it's been given to you. But yet God is saying it is yours. He has given it to you through the cross, and he's looking for you to reach out and receive that. That was, I don't know if that helps you or not, but that helped me because I'm always looking for ways to help people use these things. Amen. And if that's one of the reasons, then you can default back to helping people grab a hold of it as theirs so that they can use authority. Amen? So I thought that would be worth it. Now, let's just review as we close this out, Mark eleven twenty four out of Dr. Z. And this is another one of those, I don't like this or I do, but this is another one of those, you know, God made it this way. Uh, Mark eleven twenty four. therefore I say unto you, what things soever you put a demand on and the tense there is in the present when you pray in the present that word believe is a command continuous tense so it's saying whatever you put a demand on in the present and you pray about in the present i command you to believe that you take it in the present and then you'll see it in the future so here's the deal folks you know you know, Jesus started this whole discussion out by saying, have the faith of God. He's willing to give you his faith so it becomes your faith so that you can do this. I mean, he's not telling you to do this and do something impossible. Does that make sense to you? He started this whole discussion with have my faith, have the faith of God, the literal rendering of 1122. Does that make sense to you? So he's saying, here's my faith, and here's how you use it. If you're willing to receive it as I stir you and quicken you to the word, then what I want you to do, once you know my word, when, when you have a need in my word, when you pray, when you begin to ask me for that need, he said, I want you to take the need, and actually he said, I'm commanding you to take the need as yours in the unseen realm before you see it. Praise the Lord. And so we want to become comfortable with this because this is Jesus t telling us to do this. Does that make any sense to you? This is not some little thing off in a corner. And I was especially stirred as I was listening to that prophet the other day talk about what he was talking about, saying it's so critical to understand this, to deal with these attacks that are coming on people in our country because of the, uh, the pandemic and so forth. Does that make sense to you? It's like learning to master these. Amen. So uh, let's, let's just give one more example of how to make this conversion from petition to, uh, to decrees and commanding. Uh, during the last year, uh, one of the things that you know, happened during this COVID crisis was I began to pray and ask God, Lord, you know, how, do I, how do you deal with this? 
And I began to pray about, because, you know, everybody was saying, you know, divine protection is one of the ways you deal with this. Now, folks, I'm not saying that people don't get attacked. And if you were attacked with COVID and God kept you, praise the Lord. I'm not saying that, okay? But what I am saying is divine protection was one of the things we started reaching out for. And I began to say, God, what does divine protection look like? What do you think it looks like? A big angel standing in front of you with a shield might be, you know. But as I began to pray about divine protection and what it looks like, I, I, he took me to the 91st Psalm, and specifically he gave me the verse, under his wings oh, he will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will trust. And I said, Father, that's a cool verse. But, you know, because, because I've learned that God wants you to press him about these things. Passivity is your enemy if you haven't figured this out, okay? He wants you to press him about these things. So I went back and said, God, that's great. You gave me this verse. Under your wings, you, under, you'll cover me with your feathers, and under your wings I will trust. That's a great verse. And then I said to him, Holy Spirit, what does that look like? Well, I wouldn't do that. Well, why not? You're a child of the king. My sheep hear my voice. Why wouldn't you do that? So I said, what does that look like? And all of a sudden, I saw the dome of his presence come down over me, and it covered me from over the top of my head all the way down to the front of me. And I knew that the Holy Spirit was saying, that's what it looks like for you. So as time went on through the COVID crisis, and we've all had various experiences with that, as time went on through the COVID crisis, uh, I would say that, and there was probably three times that I remember that you know some physical symptoms started to attack me whether it was a runny nose or whatever, I'm not sure. But you know how you can tell. You don't need a degree in biology to know if, you're, if the devil's trying to make you sick, do you? Okay, so I felt something in runny nose or a stuffy head or coughing or something. And of course, the devil was sitting right on my shoulder saying, see, you've got it, you've got it. You've got COVID, right? Isn't that what he does? And so, and so you have to remember where you are and what you're doing. So I had that promise in my heart. And in all three times, what I personally am a big fan of is I took the elements, I took communion. Because for me, communion is one of the things that I use as the bulwark to stand and say, no, the body is paid, the body has been sacrificed and broken, the blood has been shed, and this has no legal right to be here in my mortal body. Amen. So I took communion, and I started walking around my living room. Now, now watch this. I'm acting out for you how you can make these switches, okay? I walked around my living room and said, Father, I thank you. I began to worship. I started with praise, not decrees. I began to worship and say, Father, I thank you that Jesus' body was striped for my healing. I thank you that on the cross he took my infirmities and bore my sicknesses. And Father, I thank you that these, this healing has been paid for. And I began to worship and pray in tongues. And as I worshiped and prayed in tongues, I just felt the presence of the Lord. And in the midst of worshiping and praying in tongues, worship is, can you not, worship can keep you in the realm of faith when you're being attacked. Amen. Why? Because God inhabits the praises of his people. Amen. So the presence is stirred as we praise. But anyway, I was sitting there saying, Father, I thank you that this attack can't be here. Now I'm saying all this as my nose is running and as I've got a headache. Are you following this? I said, Father, I thank you this attack can't be here in Jesus' name. I thank you that Jesus took this at the cross. His body was striped for my healing. His blood was shed for this sacrifice. And as the presence of God stirred within me, I don't know how long I spent praising God. It's not a formula. I just praised God until I felt the presence of the Spirit. And as the presence of the Spirit welled up within me, I turned around and I said, I curse this thing. And I say in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, whatever you are, you can't come near me in Jesus' name. Get out of my body in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I went to bed and the next morning I woke up. There wasn't one single symptom. That happened three times during this COVID crisis. Well, with some of that COVID, I don't know. God healed me so fast, I never got anywhere with it. Now, I'm not saying that to, to exalt me and condemn you or any reason like that. I'm just talking about that's how this stuff works together. 
I was praising, and as I was praising, I was reminding myself that Jesus had taken this away, and as the more I reminded myself that Jesus had taken it away, the more it rose up within me that I don't have to put up with this because Jesus took this away for me and for every other believer. And then out of that understanding that I have it, I made the decree to whatever it was, whatever sickness it was that was trying to come on me. I made the decree, and I just, at that point, I said, get out of my body. Now, that's a lot different than, Father, please heal me. There's nothing wrong with, Father, please heal me. But at some point, you've got to stop saying, Father, please heal me. And you've got to start saying what Jesus told you to do with, Father, please heal me. Father, please heal me. Okay, then now I want you to take that faith and believe what? That you believe that you take it when you pray, and then you'll see it. And so an authority comes in. This, this is one verse. The, the verse before brings authority back in the concept. Does this make any sense to you? That's just a simple little way of how you can apply this. The praise brings the stirring of the spirit. You can use communion or not. I like to use communion personally because it's a good way to remind myself of the body and the blood and the shed blood of Jesus. And then you use this term. What I'm trying to encourage you to this morning is the spirit is going to work with you because this is so basic to the Christian faith. The spirit is going to work with you. And you say, well, where am I going? He's taking you to the place where you can receive the answer to your prayer before you see it with your eyes. Why do I know that? Because Jesus commanded us to do that in this verse. This is not me telling you this. This is Jesus commanding you to believe that you receive it when you pray. Amen. So, have I said there's anything wrong with petition, folks? Let's all hear it in unison. No, there's nothing wrong with petition, okay? What am I saying? that after you're done petitioning God about your need, there has to come this place where you're ready to stop petitioning and start saying, I've asked, and God said, I am supposed to receive, and so I receive the answer to this right now in Jesus' name. Well, Henry, I did that, and my circumstances got worse. Welcome to the world of application. Yeah, gee whiz, you got opposed when you tried to apply the word of God. Go figure. Come on, that's the way this works. I'm, I'm preparing you for real life here, not just my little theories, okay? So you believe you receive and you reach out and the, and the next 30 seconds the symptoms get worse. I'm not saying that won't happen, but the point is Jesus said it's transferred. Does that really change the fact that it's in the unseen realm? It doesn't change the fact he gave you the deed when you asked for it. When you asked for it, he said, by the blood of Jesus, by the body of Christ, I decree that this petition is yours in Jesus' name. Amen. And then you go on and so forth. And if you'll follow this, because God is going to move you to now... Let me just close with this. The reason that this is important for you to master this is because there are certain things in the new covenant and in life that authority is God's answer to deal with them. One of them is the demonic. You cannot believe away the demonic attacks. You can't faith away demonic attacks. Jesus didn't say, I give you faith over serpents and scorpions, did he? He said, I give you authority over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will by any means hurt you. So the reason this is important to master that is, if you're just dealing with natural circumstances, well, then faith is fine. But what if the natural circumstances you're dealing with is because a demon spirit is trying to make you sick? If a demon spirit is trying to make you sick, then the answer to that is authority. So authority all of a sudden becomes non-optional. Jesus did this. He didn't do this every time. I believe it's Luke's account when he walked into what Peter's wife's mother-in-law, wasn't it? Peter's wife's mother-in-law or Peter's wife's mother or something, I'm not sure. But when he walked into that thing, he, Jesus walked into that thing and it said she was sick with a fever and Jesus rebuked the fever and the fever left her and she arose and ministered unto them. There are times when sickness needs to be rebuked, not believed away. There are times when authority is the answer to your problem. So if you're facing now, 
we're going to go into some more depth and give you some more points to this on this pathway. But this is just the first part of the pathway. Understand that when you're quickened and when you believe something, when the Holy Spirit deals with you, authority came with the faith of God. Authority came with that faith of God. And he gave it to you to use. And you say, well, might not, might not be very comfortable, but you can do this, folks. Amen. You can do this. I think that's, um, I think that's enough for today. Give you some steps. And next week, if we continue this, we'll give you some more steps of how you can walk into this. Does this help you? I hope so. Father, we just receive your grace this day and the illumination of your word. And Father, I release the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit to raise us all up to where we all become comfortable with using authority to deal with the circumstances and the problems and the, the things that attack us. And so, Father, we just nurture this revelation by your Spirit and bless your people with it and raise us all to a higher plane. In Jesus' name, amen.